Good morning. Welcome to Good News Lutheran Church. What a blessing it is to have you all here today as we gather around God's Word to be strengthened in our faith and to sing His praises. We're also very excited today to be celebrating the baptism of Lillian Joanne McLucky. It's great to have you all with us today. Today we're continuing our October worship series, which is entitled Alone Together. It's a series in which we are focusing on some of the central truths on which we take our stand as Christians, and especially truths that have been synonymous with what we believe as Lutherans. Sometimes taking a stand for the truth won't win you any friends. It might even make you some enemies, and yet we're seeing throughout this month that taking a stand for truths that are as important as these is still very much worth it. Today, our focus will be on the stand that we take as Lutherans, that we are saved, not by our good works, not by our own virtue, not by anything that we might do, but instead through faith in Jesus Christ alone. During this month of October, we are also introducing a new musical setting of the service that we frequently use here at Good News. Last week, we introduced a setting of the, sur the song that's known as the Gloria in Excelsis, or the Glory to God in the Highest. That's on pages 6 and 7 in your service folder. We will sing that again Today, you might recall if you were here last week that that setting of the Gloria has a recurring refrain, so that will probably sound familiar to you if you're here, if you were here last week. You're also welcome today to sing along with the verses uh, if you feel comfortable doing so. That might take a little bit longer for people to get comfortable and familiar with, but you're welcome to hop in with as much of that as you'd like. Today, the new song that we are introducing comes as part of our order of service with our celebration of Holy Communion. It's entitled Jesus, Lamb of God. So if you would open your service folder, if you do have one, I want to point out a couple of things. We're actually going to practice the song ahead of time so that when we get to that point in the service, we are comfortable with it and we can simply sing it. But before we do that, there are just a couple of very minor tweaks in wording that are part of our, the order of service in our new hymnal as well. So if you turn to page 13... On Communion Sundays, we use the Nicene Creed here at Good News, and there's just one little word in the middle of the Nicene Creed that has changed with our, our new hymnal. It doesn't really change the meaning, um, but it, it has been changed. Right in the middle of the second article, it's talking about Jesus. It says, For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. We used to say, fully human. Yeah, so the, the meaning of the wording has not changed drastically. We don't suddenly believe something different than we did last week when we said the Nicene Creed. One thing that change does do is it puts us in harmony with the wording of the Nicene Creed that is used in many other hymnals across the English-speaking Christian world. And in a confession of faith that isn't just what we believe as a church or even what we believe as Lutherans, having some harmony in the wording across wider Christianity is, is kind of a good and a valuable thing. So just that one little wording change that I didn't want to trip you up. And then if you turn the page to page 15, in the spoken responses that begin the order of service for Holy Communion, the third one, the minister says, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We're in the habit of saying, it is good and right so to do. That has been changed to, it is right to give him thanks and praise. So I just wanted to mention those two so that they don't trip you up, especially if you're so familiar with those words that you almost say them by memory. With that, if you would turn to page 17, as I mentioned, we are going to have a chance to introduce Jesus, Lamb of God, at the beginning of our service. The nice thing about this song in, in our service is that it is repetitive. It's really three statements that repeat themselves. And so we'll have the choir introduce it by singing the first one, as you can see on the screen, and then you're invited already now to join in singing uh, repetitions two and three. Then when we get to the, the part where it occurs in the order of service, you can simply sing along. Jesus, 
With that, we begin with our opening hymn, which is printed on pages four and five. Please note that we will stand for the final stanza of the hymn. Salvation unto us has come by God's free grace and favor. Good works cannot avert our doom. They help and save us never. Faith looks to Jesus Christ alone, who did for all the
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his holy life and innocent death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Our Savior Jesus Christ commanded baptism when he said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All of us are born into this world with a deep need for baptism. From our parents we inherit a sinful nature. We are without true fear of God and true faith in God and are condemned to eternal death. But Jesus took away our sin by giving his life on the cross. At our baptisms, he clothes us with the robe of his righteousness and gives us a new life. Josh and Katie, in obedience to the command of our Lord and trusting in his promise, you have brought Lillian to be baptized. Jesus told us, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. It is in baptism that God grants us the new life of forgiveness, joy, and peace to little children. By the power of God's word, this gracious water of life washes away sin, delivers from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe. So Lillian, receive the sign of the cross both on your head and on your heart to mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. Lillian Joanne McLucky, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has forgiven all your sins. By your baptism, you are born again and made a dear child of your Father in heaven, May God strengthen you to live in your baptismal grace all the days of your life. Peace be with you. Let us pray. Merciful Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessing of baptism by which you offer and grant the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. Help us to regard our baptisms as the robe of righteousness we are to wear all the days of our lives. Look with special favor on Lillian and grant her a rich measure of your spirit that she may grow in faith and godly living. Make us willing to carry out our responsibilities to those who have been baptized so that all of us may finally come to the blessed joys of heaven. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Josh and Katie, I invite you to light this candle again and again in years to come on anniversaries of this day to recall what God has done for Lillian through the gift of his son and through her baptism, which has now united her with Jesus in his death to sin and resurrection to new life. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you by his Spirit that Christ, dwelling in your hearts by faith, may fill you with all spiritual blessings. Go in peace. 
At this time, we continue with our service by singing the Gloria in Excelsis, the song of praise printed on pages 6 and 7. Please stand as we join to sing together. be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, whose grace always precedes and follows us, help us to forsake all trust in earthly gain and to find in you our heavenly treasure. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Today's first reading is written in the book of 2 Kings chapter 5. If it was simply about the life that other people see us live, we might be convinced that we could prove ourselves to be good, even good enough for God. And yet, in this reading, God demonstrates his ability to see and expose even those things that we think we are doing when no one else is looking. So Naaman went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. Even though Naaman urged him, he refused. After Naaman had traveled some distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, My master was too easy on Naaman, this Aramean, by not accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from the chariot to meet him. Is everything all right? he asked. Everything is all right, Gehazi answered. My master sent me to say, two young men from the company of prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. By all means, take two talents, said Naaman. He urged Gehazi to accept them. 
and then tied up the two talents of silver in two bags with two sets of clothing. He gave them to two of his servants, and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. When Gehazi came to the hill, he took the things from the servants and put them away in the house. He sent the men away, and they left. When he went in and stood before his master, Elisha, his master, Elisha asked him, Where have you been, Gehazi? Your servant didn't go anywhere, Gehazi answered. But Elisha said to him, Was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or to accept clothes or olive groves and vineyards or flocks and herds or male and female slaves? Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence and his skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm of the day is Psalm 90. After reading the verses of Psalm 90 responsively, we will join in the sung response printed on page 10. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born or you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. For a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. The length of our days is 70 years, or 80 if we have the strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. second reading is written in Hebrews chapter 4. The word of God is like a sharp sword that is able to cut us down to the very heart to expose our sin and our need for a savior. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel. Today's gospel is written in Mark chapter 10. These words will also serve as the basis for this morning's sermon. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. 
Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated for the hymn of the day. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Have you been taking part in the do-it-yourself revolution? In the age of the internet where you can learn anything and everything from a website or a video online, more and more people are taking building projects into their own hands rather than hiring someone to do it for them. It makes sense. It could be cheaper. It could be done quicker and maybe even better. And the bonus is, is you get a deep sense of satisfaction at a job well done. If you have the right tools, the right knowledge, and a little bit of determination, you have the makings of a successful do-it-yourself home project. But if you don't, disaster awaits. A man buys the house of his dreams. It's everything he wanted, except it's missing one thing. It doesn't have a porch, 
So naturally, the man decides to build it himself. He spends weeks gathering the materials, making the plans, and finally building his porch. He steps back, and he admires his work. But he's only forgotten one thing. He's forgotten to set the foundation correctly. Over the next few years, he'll watch as his dream porch slowly sinks into the ground. A couple has been watching a lot of home renovation television. They look around their house and they begin to realize that it's a little outdated. It feels a little stuffy. They notice a wall in their living room that could be taken out. So they decide to do it themselves. The only problem is it's a load-bearing wall. Their living room is now a lot more open, but they have a new problem. Their house is going to begin to sag. For these people, their do-it-themselves attitudes led to disasters. Today we're examining the Lutheran stand on faith alone. In a world that's all about doing it yourself, it's tempting to think that you can do the same for spiritual matters. If you're a good person, if you do the right things, if you're nice to other people, if you work hard, then maybe God will let you into heaven. But today Jesus makes it clear that it's impossible. In fact, any of your attempts to do it on your own are destined to end in disaster. But there is another way, another way which makes the impossible possible by faith. The man was a good man. He was the model citizen. He was a great father, a wonderful husband. He had done everything right, and he had everything he could have possibly wanted. A wonderful wife, a beautiful family. He had a well-paying job, a respected job, and an important job. People looked up to him. He was involved in the community. He was even the president of his church. He had everything, and on top of all that, he was still young. Few people his age could brag that they had accomplished the same things. But even though he appeared to have everything, the man was uncertain. There was this gnawing in his heart, this hole in his heart. He was a good person. He did the right things. He went to church. He read his Bible. He was good to his neighbors, good to his wife and his kids but he had this recurring nightmare. In his dreams, the man would wake up to find that he was at the gates of heaven, and the angel at the door would not let him in because he still had not done enough. This thought tugged at his heart. But one day, he heard that a wise spiritual teacher had come to town, and he wondered if this man had the one piece of the puzzle that he was missing if he knew what he could do to put him over the top to finally please God. So he went into town and he found the man walking with his disciples. So he ran and he fell to his knees before him and he said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus smiled at the man and he said, why do you call me good? Only God is good. So if you want to be good, if you want to have eternal life, do what God commands. Don't murder. Love your parents. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't defraud or cheat your neighbor. The man doesn't hesitate. He says, I've kept all of these commandments my whole life, Jesus. Jesus looks at the man, and he loves him. In an instant, he knows everything about the man. He sees his hopes, his dreams, his fears, and his restless heart. He sees his desperation to be loved and accepted by God. And there, in the man's heart, Jesus sees the man's weakness. The man thought that he had kept many of the commandments, but he had forgotten the first commandment, to love God more than anything else in the world. Jesus' next words will cut the man straight to the heart but their words spoken out of love. The man needed to see how imperfect and broken he really was. Jesus turned to the man and he said, one thing you lack. Go, sell all of your possessions and give it to the poor 
and then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the man heard this, he was crushed. His face became dark. Give away everything, everything he had earned from his life, his friends, his influence, his money, everything. He couldn't do it. He couldn't do what God had asked, and so he went away sad. The way the man was thinking made sense. We live in a world that's all about pleasing people. That's the way business works, right? A new restaurant opens up in town. People flock to try their food. If it's good, people will come back. They'll stay in business. If it's bad, they'll be out of business. That's the way our jobs work. We go to work and we please our bosses, and at the end of the week, our bosses please us with a paycheck. It's the way our relationships and friendships work. A boy likes a girl. He buys her flowers and chocolates. He takes her out on dates. Maybe he even gives her his heart. But if she doesn't invest in the relationship, if she doesn't also give him a piece of hers, it'll never go anywhere. We live in a transactional world. What you give is what you'll get out. And it makes sense that the same would apply to spiritual matters. If you're a good person, if you do good things, God will give you good things. He'll let you into heaven. And if you do bad things, God will punish you. He'll send you to hell. So God becomes another person on the list to please. To please God, you'll do what he commands. You'll love your parents. You won't murder. You won't sleep around like other people. You won't steal. You won't cheat or defraud your neighbor. You'll do your best not to tell lies. But you're not perfect. No one is. Sometimes you'll say things that you're, you'll regret. Maybe you'll do things that you know that you shouldn't. But you're only human. No one is perfect. No one is perfect except God. You can hear Jesus' words ringing in your, ear, in your ears. Only God is good. Throughout the Bible, we hear over and over again, God is perfect, God is holy, and perfection demands perfection. To stand in the presence of God, you can't be kind of good, sort of good, mostly good. You have to be always good. You have to be perfect like God is perfect. Jesus' words are like a surgeon's scalpel. They cut us open and reveal who we really are. You say you haven't murdered anyone. Jesus says anyone who hates their brother is a murderer. You say you haven't cheated on your spouse. Jesus says anyone who looks at another person lustfully has already committed adultery in their heart. You say you haven't stolen anything. God says don't even be jealous or envious of what another person has. And then God comes to the first commandment. Have you loved your God always with all of your heart, more than anything else in this world, more than your children, more than your spouse, more than your work, more than your relationships and social life? Jesus cuts you open, and he shows who you really are. You may have the world fooled, but he knows what's inside. These words of Jesus sting. They hurt but they're spoken out of love. Because before you can enter heaven, you need to see just how broken and imperfect you are. And that's something that the man failed to see. As the man turned and walked away, Jesus turned to his disciples and he said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. The disciples were surprised In Jesus' day, the rich were seen as the good people. They were the ones that everyone wanted to be like. They were the ones who took care of the poor, who gave huge offerings to church, who had done everything right, and God had blessed them. In their minds, this man would have been the first person into heaven. But Jesus went even further. He says, How hard it is, children, enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of God. 
the disciples were amazed. They turn to each other and wonder, so it's impossible. Who then can be saved if not this man? Then Jesus said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. The disciples were struggling to see what Jesus meant. Here was a man who had done everything. He was the best the world could offer, and yet he could not enter heaven. Jesus made it clear it was impossible. It doesn't matter what you do. You could give millions, no billions to charity. You could spend the rest of your life serving the poor and feeding the hungry, but that won't move the needle, not if perfection is what God demands. So what is there left for you to do? That's a question that a man hundreds of years ago asked himself as well. He came from an, ambitious ham- from an ambitious family. They had great hopes and dreams for him. He had a future of success out ahead of him. But he was caught on this one question, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to inherit eternal life? So he tried his best to please God. He even did what the rich man could not. He sold everything he had and became a monk. He studied to become a priest. He did everything right. He went to church three times a day. He confessed his sins to the priest as many times as he could. He went to serve the poor. He spent hours studying the Bible and praying. But none of that filled his heart. None of that moved the needle for him. He felt no closer to God, no more sure of his salvation. And so he became angry with God, tormented by this thought. Why would God put this burden of perfection on him? Why would God ask what he knew he could not give? One day, as the man was reading his Bible, he came across a verse that changed everything for him. In the book of Romans, he came across this short verse. The righteous shall live by faith. By faith. Faith in what? Faith in the promises of God. In the promise that he has taken salvation out of your hands and into his own. Because he loves you. Because God isn't the demanding customer or the boss that you're trying to please or the boy or the girl that you're trying to convince to like you. He doesn't need you to prove your goodness or that you're worthy of his love. Instead, he's already loved you. He takes the burden off of your shoulders and puts it onto his. Jesus says to you, you can't do this, but I can. He takes off his robes and his heavenly glory. He sets it aside. He sells his very own life to give you treasure in heaven, to open the doors of heaven for you. You can trust him. A young boy, the age of three, once asked his dad to take him hiking. But he didn't just want to go anywhere. He wanted to go and climb the small mountain in their local state park. The father knew the trail well. He knew how steep it was, how big the rocks were. He knew that it was a hard trail. It would have taken him even two hours to climb. He knew the boy couldn't do it, and so he offered to carry him. But the boy was insistent. He wanted to climb this mountain on his own. So father and son, they went to the state park. They went to the trailhead, and the boy started climbing. He climbed over some rocks and roots. He felt like he was making pretty good progress. After about half an hour, the boy looked up, and he saw that the end of the trail, the top of the mountain, was just as far as it was when he had started. He looked back. He had only covered a few hundred feet. In frustration and exhaustion, he started crying, and he called for his father. In an instant, his dad was there. He picked him up and took him up in his arms. The boy, exhausted from crying and climbing, fell asleep in his arms. A few moments later, he woke up again, but this time, in a very different place. 
there were no rocks or trees around him. Instead, as he looked around him, all he could see was the state park below him. The boy shouted with joy, taking in the marvelous view. He was awestruck. After a few minutes of celebration, he came back and he threw his arms around his father. Thank you. He knew what his dad had done. He had carried him up the mountain. It's foolish to think that a small child can climb a mountain on his own. It's foolish to think that you can finish a do-it-yourself project without the right tools or the right knowledge. It's foolish to think that you can give God what he demands, perfection. But by faith, you trust in the promises of God. By faith, you trust that he has opened heaven's doors open to you, that he has carried you up the mountain, that by faith, that by faith he has done the impossible. He has brought you home to heaven. Because in Jesus, God makes the impossible possible. Amen. Please stand. We confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into the heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. O Lord, God of hosts, reveal our sin to us through your word. Do not let us approach you in our own righteousness, but rather come before you humbly in repentance, that we may inherit eternal life by your grace in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, God of hosts, keep us from resenting those whom you send to reprove us with your law and from dismissing those who speak your truth to us that we might repent and live. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord God of hosts, sanctify us with your spirit that we may hate evil and never pursue it, but instead love good and seek it always. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord God of hosts, have pity on all your servants afflicted in body or soul. Satisfy them with your steadfast love in Christ and grant health and healing in accord with your perfect will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you once again for joining us this morning. We invite you to take a moment at this time to let us know that you were here. You can do so on your phone by visiting goodnewslc.org or by using your phone to scan the QR code on the back of today's service folder. If you'd also like to use this time to give an offering in support of our ministry, you can do so at goodnewslc.org slash give.
Our service continues on page 15 with the sacraments. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, Lord God, eternal King and gracious Father. In love you made us the crown of your creation. In mercy you planned our salvation. In grace you sent your Son to redeem us from sin. We remember and give you thanks that your eternal Son, Jesus Christ, became flesh and made his dwelling among us, that he willingly placed himself under law to redeem those under law, that he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death on a cross, that he has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Bless us as we receive your son's body and blood in this sacrament. Forgive our sins, increase our faith, strengthen our fellowship, and deepen our longing for the day when Christ will welcome us to his eternal feast. Praise and thanks and honor and glory be to you, O God our Father, and to your Son, and to the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. seated. Those who are communing with us today are directed to the front by way of the center aisle at the direction of the usher. Please note that during the distribution, all are invited to join in singing the printed distribution hymn.
So who am I that I should live and he should die under the rod? My God, my God, why have you not forsaken me? God here, oh yes, by word and promise clear, in mouth and soul, he makes us whole, Christ truly present in this meal, oh, taste and see. the true body and true blood of Christ, strengthen and keep you in the true faith to life everlasting. Your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. Amen. Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for the closing hymn. Okay.
Once again, good morning and welcome to all. What a joy to gather here with you today. We especially welcome friends and family of Josh and Katie McLucky as we celebrate the, the baptism of Lillian this morning. Very thankful to have you with us. Everyone's invited to stick around for fellowship and refreshments following the service. Those are located in the fellowship room. Everyone's also welcome and encouraged to stick around for Sunday school and Bible class, which will get started around 10.15 this morning. Once again, Sunday school children meet right back in here at about 10.15 for a quick devotion with Vicar, and then you'll be off to your rooms. Adults, we're continuing our study of Philippians in the fellowship room this morning. Then just one quick announcement I wanted to highlight. Normally, the third Sunday in October would be a Sunday for a quarterly congregational meeting. So that's next Sunday. Um, there isn't a, a ton of major things that need to be discussed or decided at this point, but there is a lot of information that we would like to share, and we'd like to share it with as much of the congregation as possible. And so rather than having a meeting after Sunday school and Bible class last week, next week at about 11 o'clock, we're actually going to simply share an update on everything that's been going on, especially related to our capital campaign and our building project immediately following the service on Sunday. So we'll have a little bit of an abbreviated service, sort of an extended congregational update following that, and then we'll still have Sunday school and Bible class following at about 1015. So look for that next Sunday. Once again, thank you for being with us. God bless you this day and throughout your week.